Thank you for joining us for this informative American Institute of Chemical Engineers webinar sponsored by Providence Consulting. Your organization is talking, is anybody listening? How to communicate hazards and talk like a team. Our speaker is Scott Kindy. <clears throat> Scott Kindy is a Senior Process Safety Management Consultant and Account Director at Providence Consulting. He has 10 years of experience in PSM-related project execution in the petrochemical industry. His expertise includes executing and managing projects related to various elements of PSM, including management of change, mechanical integrity, process safety information, process hazard analysis, and compliance audits. One quick note before I turn the session over to Scott Kindy, as described more fully on this slide, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers assumes no legal liability or responsibility for, for the use or misuse of the content in this webinar. And now I'd like to welcome Scott Kindy. Hi, Scott. Hey Pam, thank you very much. So today we're gonna to be talking about communication. So along those lines, I wanna open up with a, a short kind of story about myself. I'm, I'm married with two daughters. So what that means is I live in a house with one me and three females. Um, because of this, I've learned over the past 15 years or so that communication within my house is key. Um, I've also learned that my audience and that's a term we're going to use throughout this presentation. But the audience that I'm communicating with in my house doesn't always speak the same language that I do. Um, so I've, I've learned over time that in order for me to sometimes communicate effectively with my teenage daughters, I sometimes have to enlist the help of a team. Um, and you're also going to see that as we go through this presentation, that term team. Um, basically, by enlisting the help of my wife, um, I'm able to understand my audience a little better, and that helps me make sure that I can plan um, on how to speak to that audience and say things in such a way that, that works without setting off a, a chain reaction of emotions with my house. So hopefully just knowing this about me and this little anecdote kind of sets up the stage for what we're going to be talking about today, um, which is organizational communication. I'm glad to see, um, it's always great to see people that are in technical roles participate in non-technical discussions such as this one. Um, I hope today that you'll walk away after this with some ideas and with some method, methods, some things that you can do and take back to your organization to improve your communication within the organization. So with that, we'll get started. So first off, I think we all know technology allows us to um, track and compile more, more information than we ever have been able to before. Um, but simply compiling information, even though we can track so much of it in today's day and age, um, simply compiling it's not enough. This information has to be effectively communicated throughout an, an organization for it to be useful. So um, let's look at the overview. This is what we'll be looking at today. First of all, we're going to talk about the big picture. And the big picture in today's presentation is how communication ties into the OSHA process safety management rule and how it's woven throughout that rule. We'll also talk about some challenges with effective communication. Um, we'll also look at, these are some of the terms that I just previously used in my intro. We'll look at it, the team, uh, the team being the importance of developing teams to effectively communicate and really what the job of the of those teams is, um, how those teams can be effective. We'll talk about the audience, which means we'll talk about how to, number one, identify an audience, um, the audience that, that needs the information, and then how to tailor that information to the audience, which really leads into the plan. And the plan is how do we effectively use a team to talk to our audience and effectively communicate um, and open the lines of communication between the two. So 
So what is the big picture? As I mentioned before, we're going to talk about OSHA's PSM rule, uh, 1910. And really that can be summarized as preventing or minimizing the consequences of catastrophic release of a toxic, reactive, flammable, or explosive chemicals. So Providence has, um, OSHA breaks down the PSM rule into 14 elements. And Providence has distilled these 14 elements into, down even further, into five, what we call five PSM mindsets. Those mindsets are listed here on the screen. Um, number one, identify the hazards. Number two, communicate the hazards. Protect against the hazards. Reevaluate the hazards. And transparency about those hazards. So those are the mindsets that Providence distilled the 14 OSHA PSM elements into. We actually presented a webinar on this back in January of this year that dives deeper into all five of these mindsets. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen that, to look back in the uh, AKI archive and you can find that and um, dig a little further into all five. Today we're going to focus in on, obviously, communication. So these are the 14 elements that I mentioned, and in the, they're listed along with those five mindsets. And in this screen here, you see communication kind of focuses in on the procedures, training, and contractors. But I think what we'll see after we talk for a bit today is that actually communication is threaded through all 14 elements. Um, so we took some excerpts from each from the language in the OSHA PSM rule. And these aren't in any particular order necessarily, but these are just excerpts from, from that rule and from each one of those elements. And what you'll see here, for instance, employers shall develop a written plan of action. Employers shall consult with employees, communicate that written plan with employees. Employers shall provide to employees um, access to information, so access to PHA information and all other PSI. And then the written compilation of PSI is really meant to enable the employer and the employees to identify and understand the hazards. So really none of those things can be accomplished effectively without a great communication method. So we talked about the big picture. So now we're going to focus in on what are the challenges. So we, we understand now that OSHA PSM is really interwoven with communication. So what are the challenges to effectively communicating? Well, number one, I mentioned before, there's a lot of information out there. Information is constantly being generated, disseminated from various sources. Um, it's easy to overwhelm an organization with just the sheer amount of information that we have. We have devices that are capturing data. Think about you know, the automated data systems that you have in your facility, uh, such as KPI process data, performance data, things that are being generated real time all the time. You have groups that generate information. So you have PHA teams that generate reports. You do incident investigations, compliance audits, all of those things generate reports, findings, action items, and so on. You also have individuals within your organization who are constantly generating information that is important to the organization, whether that be some safety observations, maybe it's noticing hazards in the field, um, maybe it's just concerns about how a particular process works or system works. Maybe it's good ideas about how to improve something, issues. You have job safety analyses that are done for each and every job. So the point is there's a lot of information out there that's being generated. Another challenge that we face with communication is a simplified definition of it. So I think the generally accepted version of what is communication would be this. This is how Oxford Dictionary defines it imparting or exchanging of information by speaking, writing, or using some other medium. So basically imparting information from one place to another. And I think that's an acceptable form of communication, but when we think about it in business, I think we need to dig a little deeper. The business dictionary actually provides a, a better definition of communication. It says it's a two-way process of reaching mutual understanding. So even in the first line there, you can see a big difference between what we saw in the previous slide the generally accepted definition and the business definition. It's, we have to reach mutual understanding. So it means participants only exchange information, 
but they also create and share meaning with that information. Um, in general, it's a, it's a means of connecting people. So it, in business, obviously that's a key function of management. You can't operate an organization without communicating effectively between levels of the organization, between departments within that organization, and between single employees within the organization. So how do we do this? How do we move from imparting information to one another to a true two-way sharing of ideas? Um, you'll recall the definition says we need to exchange information and, and try to find meaning in it. So, for example, think about computer-based training, maybe a, a computer-based training session that you've set in before, um, where basically a bunch of information is imparted on you from the computer, uh, you learn a bunch of things, and then you are required to answer questions to prove that you understand it. I'm not saying this is a bad way to train. Um, in fact, it can be an effective way to train in, in many cases. However, this is a good example of information being imparted to the user. Um, we're documenting understanding, but we are simply imparting information from one place to another. So now think about that same training material, but think about being in an interactive meeting. So think about meetings that you've been in, discussions that you've been a part of, where you set in a training session with people from various levels of the organization, from various work groups in the organization, and set through and, and listen to the same type of material. But what, what I think you will find, the difference between the two, is there is true communication happening in the latter of the two. Can you think back to a time when you've heard someone from a different work group or a different level of the organization say something in one of those meetings or ask a question and you thought, wow, I never thought about it that way. Or that's why that rule is in place. Now I get it. That's why we do that that way. I didn't think about it being in my work group. That didn't make sense to me. So I've led many of these types of trainings for clients. And <clears throat> what I've seen is um, when you truly have a mix of people, when it is an interactive session where you're really promoting the exchange of information and you have various levels, various work groups within the room, that's when you see effective communication. So what are the challenges? I think they can be summed up in these three questions. How do we know what information to look at, prioritize, use, share, et cetera? The three terms that you see here in bold are what we're going to focus on next. Well, how do we know what information to, to look at, prioritize? A good team helps us know that. The next question would be, how do we identify the target audience in which to share the information? And then finally, the plan, how do we develop a good plan? How do you select the best means of sharing that information? So those are the challenges that we face. So we're going to start with, of those three components, we're going to start with the team. So what is a team? I think we first need to, if we're going to talk about teams, define what a team is. Um, basically, a team is a group of people with a full set of complementary skills required to complete a, a job, a task, sport, whatever that might be. But that group of people needs to have certain characteristics. Number one, they need to operate with a, a high degree of interdependence. We need to depend on one another. We need to share authority and responsibility. So a group of individuals doesn't share authority and responsibility. A, a, a team does. A, a team is accountable for the collective performance and has common goals and also shared rewards. So that's how we go from being just a collection of people in a room to a team. We have to meet these criteria. So think about activities at your site which currently have teams. Uh, PHA is a good example. That's an easy one uh, because OSHA requires it. OSHA provide some guidance on what that team should look like, but I would say I'm sure that most of your organizations have a pretty good definition of what a PHA team is and probably specific requirements on what that team should look like, what a good team looks like. Think about MOCs when you do hazard evaluations, hazard analysis. Um, you probably have different team makeups for different levels of MOCs. Incident investigations, compliance audits, we could go on and on, but think about as we go through these slides, I want you to think about your organization and the teams that exist within them. 
So what are the attributes of a strong team? They can be summed up pretty easily. A team needs a common goal. Um, if we're going to have a team, we need to know what we're, why that team exists. We need a, a clear game plan, so we need to understand our roles within the team and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And then we need to be moving forward. We need to be asking these types of questions. What's the next move? I'm not sitting stagnant. So think about your team. So we talked about a few of them already, PHA teams, MOC teams. Um, but I want you to think about your teams at your site within your organization. How is your team communicating? Think about it in terms of your work group. Um, across work groups, do you have good communication between um, your inspection group and your operations group? Um, Facility-wide, do, do you have good communication? And then corporately. And think about those things that we just mentioned for each one of those. Are the goals clearly identified? Do you know your role in your work group? Um, do you have a clear path forward to achieve the goals that you need? So what is the purpose of a team when we think about communication? Well, the team should be, to be effective, the team needs to be based on the audience. And when that's true, the team then can form the plan needed to reach that audience. Um, I think this is a very key step to communicating information is developing this team first and really a cross-functional team to uh, understand what different departments need, but I think this step is, is often overlooked. So how do we improve, how, does, how do we make our team successful? We need to talk like a team. Uh, we need to ask the who, what, when, why, hows, who needs to know. So when we're formulating our plan, these are the questions that we ask, who needs to know, what needs to be shared, who is the audience? What needs to be shared with them? When will it happen? This is an important one. Why is it happening? And that's often left out, but we need to communicate to our audience. Why are we communicating this? And then how will we share it in a meaningful way? So how do we make it mean something to this audience? So how do we, I've asked this question before, um, how do we do that? How do we take the next step? Do we simply, does your organization impart critical PSI or do you utilize these cross-functional teams that we're talking about to exchange information? Well, let's look at some examples. These are some questions you can ask to see if, if you are truly doing this. Uh, one pretty simple one is, is your PHA information? So when a PHA is completed at your site, how is that shared within the organization? Is it imparted on the site? Do we, does the PSM group send out a and notification that goes out to everyone that says PHA for Unit A is finished and the report is located here? Um, or are we exchanging information? Are we using cross-functional teams to help exchange information? Do you have another team or perhaps the PHA team? Are they responsible for, as a team, communicating that to their respective groups or to the organization as a whole? Because if they are, the team can then provide insight as to what information becomes important to what groups. And we're going to dive into that particular thing a few slides down when we talk about the audience. Um, but I want us to think about it in terms of the team for now. Uh, another thing to think about is your MOC system. And you can substitute MOC for any other system here, incident investigation, PHA, um, fill in the blank. Is, but we'll use MOC as an example. Is your MOC system flawless? I think we'd all say no, nothing's flawless. So how do we know where we struggle? I think if we are imparting information, we would, our PSM team most likely tells everyone or trains or whatever that is, this is how the MOC system works. And then the PSM team is expected to understand what all the challenges are for every different group and hopefully write a procedure or develop a plan that takes care of all those challenges. If we're truly exchanging information within our organization, then we might have a team in place with the sole purpose, the sole goal, as we talked about before, of understanding the challenges faced by the various parts of the organization that are related to managing change. And by doing that, we're able to then open up those avenues of communication where we've got different groups that are represented within this team that can get, then go to their respective groups and bring that feedback to the table and say, 
um, tell the PSM group or whoever is responsible for that MLC system, these are where we struggle. And when you do that, you see real change in how those things are managed. Um, let's think about process safety incidents. So we have a, when you have a process safety incident, incident that occurs within your organization, let's say, uh, loss of primary containment somewhere, how is that communicated to the organization? So from site to site, from corporate to a site, do we simply impart the information? Do we send out a one-point lesson to all of our different sites that have all the same information on it that summarizes this is what happened and this is what we learned? That's a great thing. We should do that. We should share incident information. But if we're truly exchanging information, we might consider having our corporate work groups, maybe that's PSM, reliability, whatever those work groups are, um, maybe they're communicating those incidents to their site work group team. And in doing that, and if, in doing it in such a way, in a forum like a meeting, conference call, whatever that might be, when you're opening that door to exchange information. You're opening the door for questions to be asked about that particular incident. And you're also, that corporate team that is now communicating it is most likely going to formulate their strategy, their plan to communicate it based on who they're communicating it to. So now we've talked about the big picture and the challenges and the team. Now let's look at the audience. So who is your audience? I mentioned before, uh, number one, the audience directly should directly influence the membership of the team. So if we are developing these teams to exchange this information, it should be based on our audience. Think about operators, the maintenance group, engineering, uh, various other work groups. These are the team mem potential team members um, that could that could be part of the team depending on who that audience is. If it's just operations is the only audience, then maybe your team is operators from various units. Um, if the site is your audience, then really all of these should be members of your team. A question, an important question to ask when formulating a plan is: so we've got the we understand who the audience is. Um, do we expect a response from them? Because if we don't then we're imparting information. And if we do want a response, then we need to think about how we formulate our plan to communicate to them. What does the audience need to know for their specific responses? It could be um, where, how do they need to respond? Is it via email? Do we have a SharePoint tracking site somewhere? Um, we need to understand what are they currently looking at to make decisions before we, as we formulate our plan to communicate to them. And then we need to understand their needs, obviously. And we need to clarify communication based on these needs um, and based on what the information is. Is it a simple one-point lesson? Is it a detailed report? If it's an engineering analysis communicated to a group of engineers, it, it likely is a detailed report. Um, if it's not, it could be something much simpler than maybe we're using a one-point lesson to communicate it that is tailored to our audience. And then the format of that communication how, the when, when does it need to be, where, all of those things. So let's think about that in terms of KPIs. I think we all have KPIs within our work group. Um, we, one thing to, that's very key to understanding communication is frequency of the communication matters. Um, how it's communicated and how frequently it's communicated really does matter. So let's think about reactor temperature for a minute. Um, Operations may be interested in what the temperature is now. So maybe that's something that is communicated to operations frequently. Engineering is more, maybe more interested in what the reactor temperature trends are over time. So maybe it's daily, weekly, um, to make sure that things are being operated as they should be. And then the mechanical integrity group, they may want the same type of data, but in a different way. They, they care about, are we seeing spikes in the temperature? over long stretches of time um, that might affect the integrity of the material. Uh, if so, this is what they care about. So the way that it's presented and the frequency at which it's presented is key. Um, so let's think about some specific 
details here. So we talked about KPIs a little bit. Let's talk about MOCs. So if we're thinking about the needs of our audience, when we think about MOCs, let's think about notifications. So you might be at a place where an MOC happens, so a change is made, and the entire facility gets notified that this change has been made. That's great. Um, we are definitely informing our people that changes are being made. That, that's a key thing to do. That's great. But we run the risk in doing that of really kind of inundating our, our people with MLC notifications where when something truly is important to me, I might miss it because the last 10 that I got were not important to me. So when, if we consider the needs of our audience, if we determine who our audience is, we might be tailoring those work group lists for notifications so we only send notifications to this group uh, on this type of change. If we change the pump, maybe we notify the operators and the liability group, but maybe we don't notify safety group or the PSM group or something like that. Also think about like pre and post startup actions. Are we tailoring these, the language in these, to the needs of our of the audience? So you could, for instance, you could have an action item that says update doc documentation affected by this MOC. And that's great. We, we have to keep our documentation up to date when changes happen. But if we tailor that to our audience, we might direct a specific action to a specific person or role and say update the PNIDs based on the PSSR red lines for that change, not just update all documentation. Um, think about things like installing insulation prior to startup or after startup. Uh, we might say install insulation. That's great if somebody is well versed in that, knows it, all about that change and knows what to do. But we could say install permanent aerogel insulation on the 15 foot of the new discharge piping from this pump, from pump A. And that's a lot more specific. It's tailored to the needs of our audience. And then we need to know, we need to ask this question to ourselves, does this action require a response? So we want them to go do the action. Do we want a response to the action that we assigned? And if so, is it clearly stated? And do we allow for these responses to be recorded? So we assign a group, uh, an action item or whatever that might be, make this communication for this group to go make a change. Are we allowing them a chance to exchange information with us. What if the change wasn't actually made in the field or it wasn't made the way the red lines say it was? Are we allowing them to be able to respond to that and for that to be documented? Um, let's think about it in terms of PHA. So I talked about this a little bit before, um, but I wanted to get into it a little more here. So notification, that notification that we talked about, if we have a, a PHA team or a cross-functional team that's responsible for that notification, then we might consider that the notification might want to, it might should look differently for one group than the other. Um, for instance, the notification to the reliability and maintenance group, we might want to include in that a list of all of the new IPLs or all of the IPLs taken during that PHA along with whatever the testing frequency requirements are. Um, if we are now have something that's an IPL that wasn't previously, we might be required to, to test that now or test it more frequently. So that would be information that's useful to that group. If we are sending a notification to the controls group, you might want to limit that to just controls group, this PHA was performed, here's the report, but also here's a, an IPL list and it's been filtered for instrumented IPLs only. So now you can see what all of the new IPLs taken in this unit are. Those are examples of if we do use those teams and we do think about who our audience is, we might not send so much canned information out. We might really tailor those to their needs. So now we've talked about uh, the challenges, the team, the audience, and now let's talk about the plan. And really what we're going to see here is the plan is putting these things together. It's, it's understanding the team and the audience and what factors those play and putting it all together into a plan. So 
a key part of the plan is to narrow the focus. So we've got a, a couple of examples listed here. Talked about KPIs a little bit already. Um, we need to choose KPIs carefully to communicate what's most meaningful. So we we talked about different ways to do that. Um, I think sometimes with KPIs, we have to be careful not to get caught up in the details, but focus on the big picture. We need to think about trending data when we report KPIs. Um, for instance, it may be useful to communicate that we have 53 overdue action items, but it might be more useful to communicate that we run on an average of 50 over the past six months. When we have that data point, then we understand 53 isn't, the sky may not be falling, right? That's not far from where we have run over the past six months. May not mean that it's good, um, but it, it puts things in perspective. We also need to simplify information where we can. Um, again, the plan is knowing the audience. We need to allow access for discussion and review, so we're really not we can't expect information to be exchanged between various groups, between various levels, unless we are allowing access, requesting feedback, and building those, building that capability into our systems. Maybe that means utilizing SharePoint when we communicate something out and allowing places for questions or comments. Um, and then also providing a means of not only recording that feedback, but tracking whatever resulting actions come from the feedback. Because if we just, even if we record everything that's fed back to us, if we don't ever do anything with it, we're gonna discourage people exchanging information. So um, we talked about this quite a bit, but the plan should include cross-team sharing. And this means using teamwork to determine the focus, how do we message the material, um, how do we, when we use this term cross-team sharing, how do we accomplish that, right? Uh, one way is lunch and learns, um, having, you know, once a month lunch where you bring in operations, maintenance, engineering, so on, and bring them into one room and have, have a specific goal that that team is looking to accomplish. Uh, just bringing them together and encouraging conversation. One easy way. Another way is newsletters, you know, just bringing somebody, bringing groups of people together for a, to generate a newsletter. And maybe that means once a month, once a quarter, they get together and they talk about what's going on in our facility. Um, what's important to my group that's going on right now, I want to get that in the newsletter. That encourages that exchange of information. And we start to build those avenues that people then will continue to use um, when they're communicating other information. Think about what our group cares about and communicate that. This is what our group cares about them see. Um, and then team training sessions could go on and on. So a plan must have structure, it must have process. And I know these last couple of slides, this is all kind of conceptual stuff. We're gonna tie it together in a minute, but we have to build plans with structures and processes. We have to set up those pathways that I mentioned for two-way conversations if we expect information to be exchanged. Um, we have to have, we have to set up those meetings and set up the processes for formal and informal sharing. So what can I do? We talked about up to this point, um, some examples of, of things that, that we've seen work in the past at different places, some examples, uh, some comparisons of imparting information versus actually exchanging information. So when you leave here, what can you do? What can you go back to your facility, take back to your place of work and actually do? Um, well, let's consider some of those, th those things that we talked about today. Um, establish a team. So think of a goal. Maybe that goal is improve our MLC process. Maybe that goal is develop better PSSR checklists. Maybe it's um, we need better hot work permits. Or we don't have a very good way to share incidents. So I'm sure we can find a problem pretty easily. So find the problem, find out what the goal is, we need to improve this, and then try that. Establish a cross-functional team to solve that problem. Don't try to solve it just within your work group. Um, when you do that, 
or um, when you establish that team, make sure it is cross-functional, make sure you have people from various work groups, and I would argue various levels of the organization. Also, the next time you do a training session or any kind of roundtable discussion, um, maybe don't group all of the operators together when you do the next MOC training. Maybe um, establish groups that have maintenance, reliability, operations, all in one room together when you do that group training session and see what happens. And you'll, I think what you'll see is those lines of communication that we struggle to open start to open naturally because we're in the same room and we can start to get a sense of, oh, this is a problem for this group, but it's not for this group. doesn't mean it's not a problem. We've just never heard it before because we've never had these conversations. Another thing you can do is think about your specific work group. So the work group that you belong to, think about the information that you share with others, with other work groups. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that could be, whatever that is for you, think about it. And then do the same thing that we did when we, when we found a, a problem to solve, right? Think about the information that you share. We'll develop a team to actually, with the purpose of dissecting that information, if the people that you share it with, have a lunch with those people and say, here's the information that we share with you. This is why we think it's important. We want to know from you why you think it's important or not important. And I think what we'll find is sometimes the things that are important to us really mean nothing to someone else uh, because either they haven't been explained that way or they just don't mean anything to them, but it could mean something if it were divided in a different way. So what else can we do? Just going on down the line. Think about the communication that you sent out or send out on a site-wide basis periodically. We talked about PHAs as a good example, MOC notifications as a good example, um, incident investigations could be another one. So think about that information that you maybe you see, maybe those are the emails you ignore, and think about how can we revamp this so that we so that I'm targeted. So that when I see that email, I know it's, it's meant for me. It's not meant for everyone. It's meant for my work group, and it's going to mean something to my work group, and it's going to encourage me to open it. And then think about also what communication is currently one way. So I know we all have this. Um, what information do we know that we're just imparting on a group? Maybe it's a KPI that we put out there. Um, maybe it's MLC notification. But think about... What information currently we know has an arrow only going one way? We're imparting this information and I never hear back. I know I send it out, but I never hear anything else about it. Think about establishing a two-way street for that. So we share it this way. Maybe we just share it via email or we go put it in some folder for everyone to look at. Maybe we should add another folder there for people to provide feedback. Um, maybe we can use a SharePoint site, something like that. But Think about those, that information that goes out one way and ways that you can make it two-way and see what happens. So I'll end with this. Um, these are the main points that we talked about. Communication is key. I think, I think you're here in this webinar because you believe that. Um, and it's got to be a two-way street. It's not just imparting information. It's exchanging information and, most importantly, sharing the meaning. Do it effectively. It requires a team. That team, in most cases, in many cases, should be comprised of individuals from various work groups, but also various levels of an organization for it to be effective. We need to predetermine our audience. And then finally, we need a plan that focuses on the meaningful, encourages feedback, and is truly structured and marketed to our audience. So at this time, we will open it up for questions. Okay, thank you, Scott. We have uh, a lot of questions. If anyone still wants to um, submit them, please please send it to them to host in the chat box. So, first question: How can we how can we develop communication protocol at the corporate level and site level? Is there any best practice available to provide guidance? So I think if the question is, is there a best practice document out there that I'm aware of, uh, the answer would be, would be no. Um, but I think one of the 
one of the points that I hit on in the presentation, when communicating from the corporate level to the site level, I think a lot of times the, the misconception or what we do wrong is we communicate to the entire site in one way. So corporate communicates to the site as a whole. Um, I would I would say a good practice would be to get the site personnel, the site work groups involved with corporate at the work group level. So if you don't have those already, establish those work groups, maybe it's a reliability work group or a PSM work group that opens that line of communication between corporate and site, but not at a holistic level, at a specific work group level. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned incident investigations, which has me wondering, do incident investigations normally reveal failure to communicate as a casual factor of an incident? And is there a dollar value or some other tangible thing that I can attribute to communication? That's a really good question. Um, I, I would doubt that many incident investigations would would say that in those words. They would say communication was a problem. But I bet there are, and I don't have numbers, um, but I'm sure they could be obtained. How many incidents occurred because of lack of understanding of a particular subject matter? Maybe it was a procedure. Um, because I think that's what we see a lot of incidents boil down to. Um, procedure was in place but procedure was not understood. That's definitely a communication problem, although you might not even see the word communicate in there. Um, often we call it a training problem, um, but I think all of those are hand in hand. I think if that is what the results of having poor communication is people not understanding the rules that are currently in place. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a lot that came in while you were talking. In your opinion, what are the key elements, foundation pillars of an ideal risk communication process? Um, well, I think the pillars that I would think of um, would be the things that were mentioned here. I think it would be um, pillars are establishing pathways number one, so you have to have pathways for effective communication. Um, to exchange data, you need to exchange information, truly exchange it. You need to have a pathway to impart it, but also to for that person to impart information back. Um, and if, we, if it's a one-way street, then we're not, we're not being effective. Um, another pillar I would think would be cross-pollination. So, um, cross-pollination of groups. We have to, a key pillar is taking group A and group B and making sure they have a means to talk to one another that's outside of a leadership team for the facility. So you've got leadership, which all oversees different work groups that may meet on occasion, but are those work groups, are we forcing that interaction? So I think pillar, pillar one is Pathway to talk. Pillar two is um, cross pollinating the work groups, um, and I think pillar three is just is leadership. It's encouraging the exchange, so putting the pathways in place to do it, having the people talk, and then having leadership encourage it. Okay, thank you. Uh, multidisciplinary teams are sometimes established and start off as useful tools for communication. But as time progresses, the team can change, lose focus, or shift job tasks. Do you have recommendations for retraining multidisciplinary teams to ensure teams still function as planned? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think one way to, because I think a lot of that has to do with people being on a team for too long, they lose interest. Um, like you said, they get busy. It starts as a priority for them, so it's a really cool new idea. And then all of a sudden, it you know, after I've been on it for six months, I've been a part of this team. I've had some great ideas. Those start to fade because I'm less interested. I think I've heard everything that I needed to hear from all the other groups. So I think one way to combat that 
is to change out the people periodically. And, and I don't think one person needs to spend a long time on a single team. I think rotating personnel from all those work groups in and out of that team will keep the ideas fresh. It'll keep people interested um, and keep the team moving forward because that way you can challenge when we have the first group come in, challenge them to fix a problem. Um, when the next group comes in, Maybe they look at what was done previously, but either you challenge them to continue on that or, or give them a new problem to fix. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's cycling people in and out so they're not losing interest. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. What do you do if somebody gets emotionally involved and overly defensive during the technical discussions? Yeah, that can happen. Um, that can definitely happen with any team. So I think it's important uh, with any team to have to have a leader, uh, to have someone who's responsible for keeping the meeting on track, uh, but also that can shut the meeting down if need be. Um, that can say, you know, maybe today isn't the best time to. Maybe we're not. We're obviously not going to accomplish this today. Um, emotions are running high. Maybe we're in the middle of a turnaround and. This group's really busy and it's just not worth it today. So I think having some accountability on a, a person, like a chairman of that team is important to, uh, to be able to keep you on track in general, but when emotions do run high, to be able to, to shut it down if need be and, and go their separate ways. Because I think that's a challenge in, in anything, whether you're talking about cross-functional teams or your own work group teams, whatever that might be, um, emotions run high. So unless somebody has the, the authority to, uh, to end it, then you can run into trouble. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question from a student at um, San Jose State. I do lab inspections and I want to know how to effectively communicate a sense of urgency for action without sounding demanding. My audiences are professors who might not see the importance of certain safety practices. Yeah, that can be a tough spot. I think anytime you're communicating urgency, if you don't have the immediate authority, it can be difficult. I think a way to accomplish that would be to express not only the urgency, uh, if you were to get an email that says, I, I need you to answer this question and I need it today. And that's all you saw. The urgency was communicated. But if you don't really understand why, that may, even though there's some urgency there, it may fall down to the bottom of your list because you don't see the, the importance of it is not truly communicated to you. You can see that it's important to that person, but not how it's important to the organization or to that work group or to whatever to the site, at the site level. So I would say communicate the urgency, but also communicate the why. Um, and if need be, if you do have channels where you, you have supervision of those people that can be, you know, copied on emails and things like that to add a sense of accountability to it, that helps as well, even if it's just copying peers of someone um, on an email. It, anything you can do to add some accountability will will help them be accountable. They, they might or might not respond to that well. So you have to be careful about how you go about that. But I think in most cases, the issue is not, they don't think it's urgent. Um, I think it's they don't understand why it's urgent. Or it's not that they don't care that it's urgent, they don't understand why it's urgent. Okay, thank you. All the cross-functional communication requires man hours spent by all. How do you plan for this kind of program? Yeah, very good question. Um, one of the slides that we looked at mentioned lunch and learns. Um, that's a way, you bring people in, you buy them lunch. Um, you know, maybe you tell them this is not a mandatory meeting, but we'll, we'll provide you lunch and we'd love for you to show up and this is what we're gonna try to accomplish. Most people, even when they're not getting paid for it, enjoy getting a free lunch. 
and it's a lot cheaper to, to do that than it is to, to pay all the people in those meetings. I think also, you know, doing, doing that kind of thing, also limiting the meeting time, it can get out of hand really quickly. And, and not necessarily because they're, the team is doing it on purpose, but some people may just be really bought into the idea and really enjoy the team that they're on, and they may want to meet all the time. They may want to meet twice a week, and that may not be good for the organization. Even though they may be accomplishing things, um, it, it may be a strain on the organization financially. So um, I think it's, it's being responsible about how many meetings occur with those teams, and it's looking for ways such as lunch and learns to to make it where people are essentially coming in on their own time but um, but they're still getting something out of it. How can communication maximize corporate memory, in other words, minimize corporate forgettery? Um, I don't know that I fully understand the question, but I, I think what I would say is communication maximizes memory in the, just simply because things that happen, if they're communicated effectively, people remember them. Um, I think we, what we learn from, from history in general is if we, if we don't know it, if we don't understand it, if it was never told to us, then we're destined to repeat it. Um, I think the same would apply here. I think uh, just like going back to the incident investigation findings question, um, a symptom of poor communication would be corporate not learning from things, um, also just like it would be an incident occurring. Okay, thanks. Um, from your experience, what percentage of companies follow a two-way communication practice? Low, um, I would say it's low, 10%. Um, I think, and it depends on on what you're what you're talking about. I think, um, but as a general rule, what you know, how many companies out there, when communicating, all the things that are communicated at the site level, I would say it's very low that that everything's a two-way street. I think oftentimes, if if something is really important, we may. Let's say we're rolling out a new MOC system for our site. We might roll out that training and we might do really good after the training gets rolled out at capturing feedback from everyone, or we may even do it before we do the formal training where we have a group come in and go through the training with them and capture that feedback. So that's a two-way street. So I, I think in a lot of companies would do that well um, when it's the big ticket items, but I think it's the smaller ticket items. I'd say it's it's low, low percentage. Okay, thank you. What is an IPL? So, yeah, I apologize for uh, for not spelling that out. Um, IPL would just be an independent protection layer. So it's a it's a safeguard or a layer of protection that gets identified during a process hazard analysis. So it's a it's a means of protecting from an unwanted outcome. Okay, thanks. Um, have you any recommendations about how to manage the frequency of communication daily, weekly? Well, I think it depends on, on the item, right? And I think it, it depends on, just like we talked about, certain information is important daily, certain information is important hourly, um, but certain informa information is not important daily. And for instance, if overdue action items, maybe you have overdue post startup MOC action items, um, and you, if you communicate daily with the owner of that via email or whatever, whatever that might, Badger mail, whatever it might be, that is probably going to start getting ignored. Um, so you might want to, number one, find a different way to communicate with them, maybe schedule a meeting or something like that. But something like that, communicating hourly, daily, is not as important. You're probably looking at a, a weekly email to, to remind them. Maybe it's on a, every Monday afternoon or something like that. So I think it depends on what's being communicated. I don't think there's any secret magic formula out there that says this is how often you do it for this. 
Um, it, it just depends on what what you're communicating. Okay, thanks. Uh, my employer does in-house PHAs with an in-house facilitator, and our PHA teams are usually the facilitator and maybe an operator when they are available, and maybe one engineer. This seems inadequate because I'm not convinced there is sufficient exchange of information. How can I convince my leadership that this PHA team arrangement is inadequate? Yeah, that's a good question. I think if you just look at the letter of the law, you're going to see that it's not necessarily inadequate, and that might be what, what leadership is, is pointing to. Um, I think what you could do is look for um, best practices, whether that be maybe you have sister sites or something that um, talk to people in other work groups that um, do it differently than you. If your whole organization does it the same way, it may be a little more difficult. That would be one avenue. Let's look at site B and see how they're doing it and, and talk to their, have our leadership talk to their leadership. Um, that's just if you, if you don't feel like you're getting leadership's ear. I mean, I think you could argue the importance of a PHA is astronomical. I mean, that's, that's how engineering decisions get made. That's how we determine what kind of safeguards we're going to put in place and depend on to keep our facility safe. So just from a pure is it important standpoint, there's a lot to argue there on getting the most qualified people in the room. But the PSM rule is not going to tell you you've got to have 10 people in there. Um, it's, it's going to basically tell you you've got to have somebody knowledgeable in the process and knowledgeable in the facilitation method. So I would stay away from pointing to the reg and point more towards best practices and, and potentially best practices within your company and things that people have learned. Okay, thanks. In your experience, um, are complexity and time availability considered in the communication format? Definitely. Um, I think complexity of what's being communicated is going to drive the form of communication, certainly. Um, when you say time, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Maybe time it takes to to do the communication. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think those are elements that need to be considered. What is the complexity of the change? Um, that, that's going to drive how it gets communicated. If time means um, time could be an element of if it's super important, it needs to be communicated, and maybe it's a, a read receipt or something on an email or closing an action item needs to happen today. You can put time restraints on the exchange of the information to drive priority. Okay, thank you, Scott. If uh, anyone still has a question that wasn't answered, I think we got to most all of them, but if you still have one, uh, please send it to producer at ASCHE.org, and I will forward it to Scott. So now on behalf of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and everyone who attended today, I'd like to thank Scott Kindy for this informative presentation. Thanks also to our participants for your cooperation and thoughtful questions. Please visit ASCHE.org to replay this session or to view and sign up for our many others. A reminder to also please fill out the evalu evaluation form that will appear on screen when you log out. Goodbye, and we hope to see you again in a webinar soon.